Hello, I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. Welcome to the Prehistory Guys podcast for March 2021. This month, we're looking into discoveries from Egypt and the Middle East all the way to Orkney and maybe the whole world as well. Sounds about grandiose, but I know where we're going with that. So hang on in there. Anyway, not forgetting the regular features, of course, pushing back a boundary, naming a new stonehead of the month and rounding off with a little whimsy. Mm, plus, as promised, for our main theme this month, we are taking a much more detailed look at the news that flooded the headlines recently about Stonehenge originally coming from Wales. Yeah, we really felt this warranted closer examination because the actual details are far less cut and dried than the media would have you believe. Yeah. We may have cut out <laughs> you know, and sort of bitten off a bit more than we can chew there, but uh, stick around. You'll find out there's quite a bit more to this than meets the eye. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Well, all that said, let's crack on with the show. Let's do that thing. So, all right, Rupert, maestro. Take it away. What's pushing back the boundaries this month? Well, this is a wonderful discovery from Abydos in Egypt. And Abydos is it's about 100 miles northwest of Luxor, if that gives you a frame of reference, uh, where a joint Egyptian and American team of archaeologists have discovered the earliest known mass production brewery what took Yay. them so long <laughs> <laughs> well the thing the, the brewery has been known about for about a century but it's the results of these excavations have uh, taken researchers by surprise now it's be it's believed to date to the reign of King Nama now he was the founder of the first dynasty who ruled about 5000 years ago and the scale of this is really something we haven't seen before. The site is arranged into eight working areas, each with uh, two rows of about 20 pots. And the researchers say that the site was capable of producing 22,400 litres of beer at a time. <laughs> oh, thirsty work for that pyramid building. I mean, uh, are we in the right scale of uh, time there for pyramid building, or is this, uh, is this it's, before? Uh, it's early, isn't it? It's early, it's, isn't it? I thought um, it was 5,000 uh, years ago. But that is serious it, production line. It's, oh, it's breathtaking. Yeah, yeah. It's breathtaking. Now, it, it's um, uh, it's. Intriguingly, it is associated, the site, you know, its position, it's associated with a funerary complex. Oh, so, okay. uh, so, I mean, understandably, I <laughs> can't yeah. argue with it, really. In this instance, they're, they're saying that they, they think that the beer was produced for ritual consumption. Uh, obviously, that may or may not be the case, but uh, um, either way... That, that is this month's boundary pushed the <laughs> oldest known mass production brewery rupert soskin for the prehistory guys abydos egypt you really have gone stir crazy haven't you? <laughs> you wish good grief what are we to do with you <laughs> all right Let's get on with a bit of news. First up in the news, um, I'm taking us to Western Russia and the Baltic mm. states to look at 8,200-year-old burials with elk's teeth, pendants and adornments. The island uh, of Yushinyi Olinyi Ostrov well in done. Lake Onega in Western Russia. It's home to... Well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to check it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, home to a large burial mound which contained the remains of numerous individuals of all ages. It seems that decorating clothing with elk's teeth was a common theme for Mesolithic people throughout the region, spreading all the way through modern-day Baltic and Scandinavia and on into Russia. But the team, led by Professor Christina Manamar of the Department of Cultures in Helsinki, have examined over 4,000 tooth 4, ornaments 000, from yeah, throughout the region, including beaver and bear teeth, but the vast majority of these items are from elk. So this really is an example of painstaking archaeology. Mind you, 
it has to be said, most archaeology done is really painstaking. Anyway, that is true. That is true. It is another example of it because obviously the fabrics have all rotted away and it's from the positions of the teeth in the burials that they've been able to reconstruct how they would have been attached and how they would have decorated the clothing. Hmm. So the thing that um, makes this uh, burial in Russia so different is that in all the other burials, the teeth have been perforated to take the thread. Here, a groove has been scored round the root of the teeth, so the cord or thread can be tied around them, or tied around them rather than through them. Hmm. So obviously, that would have been much quicker and more energy efficient process. So maybe this was about being able to handle a greater quantities of teeth. We really don't know. But the women in this one grave. The woman, I should say, the woman in this one grave, number 127, was wearing a belt or apron containing 90 elk teeth. That's a lot of teeth. Other interesting aspects are that the greatest number of elk teeth... <laughs> <laughs> Other interesting aspects are that the greatest numbers of elk teeth ornaments are associated with young adults not children or the elderly, whatever that might signify. And the larger ornaments would require the teeth of between 8 and 18 elks. They're big animals. Wow. And that's a lot of big animals to decorate your clothes with. <laughs> Goodness <laughs> sakes. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the artist's impressions uh, of this clothing, they do look astonishing, don't they? Oh, they are. Uh, and the video viewers of this podcast will be able to see, I'm sure, something reproduced in the screen right now. But they, yes, mm. they are stunning pieces of work. Makes you wonder if they danced in them. Yeah? What would that sound like? Yeah, that's a good point. The rattling of elk's teeth. Mm. <laughs> Over yes. to you, Mr. Soskin. I believe you have something for us. I, I do, I do. Moving on, yes. This is a new piece of research about how a flip of the Earth's magnetic field could oh, have been a primary cause for the demise of the Neanderthals. Okay. Uh, now, basically, it's been known for quite some time that there was a temporary shift of the Earth's magnetic poles around forty-one or 42,000 years ago. And when the poles switch, there is understandably a period when the magnetic field itself diminishes. And in this instance, they've been able to calculate that it dropped to about 6% of its normal value. Now, the thing is that it's the magnetic field that protects the planet from solar radiation. So that almost non-existent field meant that the solar barrage blasted the ozone layer and the consequent surge in UV radiation ionised much of the atmosphere, causing enormous winds and flash, fri flash fires across the planet. Well, how can they tell? Oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot. Cry. <laughs> was I supposed to cry there? Was yes. I supposed? How, how can, can they, they tell? tell? You said, hey, "Thank you, <laughs> thank you." <laughs> Your, your input is much appreciated. <laughs> well, the thing is that because the atmosphere is it's basically is ripped open, Yikes. the levels of C14 are greatly increased. And this is it's an extraordinary piece of synchronicity, really, but um, some fossilised cowry trees that lived right through this event have been found in the wetlands of northern New Zealand. Yes, I remember seeing and, that as well. Yeah, yeah amazing. And mm. Alan Cooper at the South Australian Museum in Adelaide and his team of researchers have been able to use dendrochronology to narrow down the time when it happened to between 41,560 and 41,050 years ago. And they can tell that this flip lasted for less than a 1,000 years. Um it's uh, just astonishing research. Now, the team have been able to compare their data with records from sites across the Pacific, and they've found that the growth of ice sheets and glaciers over North America, large shifts in major wind belts and tropical storm systems, could be traced back to the same event. And the timing of all this coincides with the demise of much of the megafauna in Australasia and the Neanderthals in Europe. Oh, my goodness. 
it's it's an amazing kind of correlation of all yeah, these yeah, yeah. Um, bits of information. So the, the the thinking is that all this relates to the adaptability of these species under extreme conditions. So uh, uh, there you go. It is possible that that was the event that uh, that really kicked off the end of the Neanderthals. Amazing oh, wow. piece of research. I think there's probably something we're going to be talking about uh, a bit more. Uh, I uh, yeah, think certainly so. it's going to be out there. Yeah. But it makes it all the more uncomfortable when you think the scientists have been saying for some time that we're due for another flip any time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um well anyway, this next one um it's m- I was going to say more cheery, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it, but it, at least it's short and sweet, mm. and uh, you know, and watch this space. <laughs> Back on Orkney, <laughs> you might remember that recently we told you about the discovery of a new settlement on the island, likely to be similar to Scarra Bray. Well, just uh, two weeks after that discovery was made, a farmer has found a, a kissed burial at Scale Farm, not far from Scarra Bray itself. The skeleton is well preserved, buried in a crouched position on its right-hand side. Don't yet know whether it's a man or a woman. At this stage, it's thought to be over 4,000 years old, Neolithic or Early Bronze Age. Archaeologists are on the scene, so we'll bring you more information when it's available. (laughs) Yeah, Orkney. It really is the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, and prehistory guys the show that keeps on saying Orkney really is the gift on that keeps on giving, isn't it? I don't think I'm that's the first apologize. time we've said that. Probably not. Not going to apologise. Uh, Won't be the last. <laughs> Genius. Right, here we are, embarking upon our main theme for this podcast of March 2021, Stonehenge. Mm. We thought we were going to make things simple for you. (laughs) We thought we were going to do loads of research and, you know, it'd be easy and Mm -hmm. uh, present you with the the claim... The plain, cold, hard facts that would yeah, uh, enable us, uh, everyone, uh, to be able to see through the the, uh, the mists that have been created <laughs> around the whole thing of mm. Stonehenge and the blue stones of Stonehenge. We did, but, but what did we find? Well, okay. I mean, just to just to kick off, let's frame this a bit. Twelfth of February, two thousand and twenty-one, BBC broadcast a programme hosted by Professor Alice Roberts called Stonehenge, The Lost Circle Revealed. Both leading up to and afterwards, there's a flurry of headlines in the press ranging from the reasonably restrained to the outright sensational. (laughs) To cut to the chase, the end result has been, to the dismay of many in the archaeological community, and uh, you and me both, Rupert, I think... Indeed. The perception has been left with the general public that Stonehenge had a previous existence in the South Wales hills before it was transported wholesale to what is now Wiltshire. We followed up that broadcast with a sort of short, off-the-cuff show of our own on YouTube that attempted to address some of what the um, what we regarded as misleading elements of that programme. In some eyes, that was interpreted as an attack on the lead archaeologist that was featured in the BBC show, namely Professor Mike Parker Pearson. It was not. What Mike Parker Pearson has done here is amazing, and we hope by the time you've got to the end of this segment, you'll get a sense of the high regard we've got for him. What we were trying to do, however, is point out that there was so much more nuance to the actual finds that have been made and the results that have been extracted. Moreover, that there are other voices in the field that were ignored by the BBC and all is not as simple as it was made out. All Mm. that said, the story is amazing, the questions it poses are mind-bending and the picture of people in the late Neolithic and what they were up to remains just as enigmatic, if not more so, than before Mm. the, the, the gloss of certainty that was painted over this whole question of the origin to the Blue Stones of Stonehenge by the BBC programme. So our purpose was just to try and make this real again, strip it back to the actual evidence and leave you, Mm. we hope, 
much more excited by just how much more complex this story is than the impression left by the BBC. Yes, indeed. So wish us luck. <laughs> yes, wish us luck. We're going in. I think it's it's a very important point to make, you know, right at the top, that uh, you know, if we're referencing that documentary, that that's an edit. We don't know what hit <laughs> what hit the cutting room floor that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but uh, but you know, being left with that overall impression that was leapt upon by the media that Stonehenge existed. Uh, in a uh, you know in a previous uh, form, it existed in uh, in in Wales. Uh, it's just wrong, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. But um, let's, let's pick it out. I mean, the, the, for me, there's the, the the basic thing right at the beginning is that if you're going to say that it was just taken, and we are talking about the blue stones, we're not talking about the trilithons, the massive stones that everybody thinks of when we talk about Stonehenge. It is the blue stones, the smaller stones um, at Stonehenge that are in question here. Uh, and the thing is that it, the the circle, the, the, the apparent circle that has been uh, located, if you like, uh, in Priscilla, um, to say that that was carried wholesale to uh, to Wiltshire is clearly wrong to begin with because there are still some stones there. That's how it was found. So, uh, so, <laughs> so you can't say that it was taken wholesale to Wiltshire because mm. some of them are still there. So apart from that, now, Mike, you have been, you have much more Stonehenge detail in your head than <laughs> I do. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to extract it from you. In, yes. Uh, in, uh, yes, in, in Lord knows what manner. <laughs> but but the, yeah. the thing is, um, to look at the complexity of this, uh, because the blue stones themselves, they are not one type of stone, are they? Um, no, they are not. Uh, before I, I uh, answer that more fully, I have to say we are not disputing that the blue stones came from the Priscilla Hills all the way to Stonehenge. In, indeed, no. That That indeed. is an established uh, fact. Uh, well, it, it, it was actually Herbert Henry Thomas who first pinpointed the Priscillas back in yeah. the 1920s. So it, yeah. it, the location of the stone, you know, the yeah. sources of the stone, um, have been known for a century yeah. now. And nor am I going to even begin to pretend to know more... Uh, than any of the proper archaeologists that have worked <laughs> on this, on no. you know, for the past twenty years, for goodness' sakes, they have extracted an enormous amount of information, and you know, to be honest, I've just scratched the surface. But we've got enough of the base facts, I think. To it, the point is refuting the impression that was mm -hmm. left and that has been promulgated by the press. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Let me answer that question. No, the blue stones at Stonehenge. There is more than uh, one type. Uh, it depends how deep a dive you want to go on on typology uh, here. But basically, it boils down to three basic types. Actually, uh, the spotted blue stones, the unspotted blue stones, and the rhyolites. There is volcanic ash type. There is sandstone type. I think there's volcanic ash of two types, but I don't want to get that complicated mm -hmm. about it. The point is that the the much, much larger proportion of the blue stones at Stonehenge are of the spotted dolerite variety, OK? Keep that in, in mind. Uh, and in passing, blue stones, they're not blue. Blue stones <laughs> is, a, is a sort of generic overall term for mm -hmm. stones that do, do not belong at uh, Stonehenge and came from further away. Yeah. Next question. Um, okay. The quarry sites in Priscilla, um, yep. because um, they they well they weren't all pinpointed. It was uh, Thomas who who, who actually uh, located the sources as Priscilla back in the twenties, but the actual finding of the quarries 
I mean, there's a lot of work. Tim Darville and Jeffrey Wainwright uh, did yeah. uh, some very important work on locating uh, quarry sites back in the God, was it the very early 2000s, wasn't it? Might even have been the 90s. I don't remember. Well, no, it could be because that was all part of the Spaces project, which mm -hmm. um, I think they did that before they did the excavation actually at Stonehenge uh, down on uh, yeah. uh, the Q and R holes. Mm. You have to be careful how you say that. You do. <laughs> well done, by the way. The Q and R holes. <laughs> but so the so the the quarry sites in in the Priscillas. Bearing in mind here that we're talking about 140, is it 141 miles from Priscelli to uh it Depends uh, to, if you're talking as the crow flies or via yes. the A40. Or via the A40, yes. <laughs> yes, that little known Neolithic road. Yeah. Um, uh, so four quarry sites up on the Priscelli. So tell, uh, how, how are they actually, topographically, how do they relate to each other? Can we give, uh, can we give our think... listeners and viewers a... a, a in their mind's eye, how are these yeah. positions? Uh, Priscelli relation? Hills um, run uh, as a ridge that uh, runs approximately east to west. Um, the three highest of the quarries are Khan uh, Maini, um, uh, Khan Goidog, and Kerig Markogian. Okay, well so they, uh, you know, they're above the kind of three hundred meters height. Uh, elevation mm -hmm. level. Further up north, down the slope, uh, going north, uh, is the site of Krai um, Grossi Fellen. Now, Krai, uh, Khan, Khan Goideg, Khan Goidog, is now reckoned to be the main source of spotted dolerite stones for the blue stones at Stonehenge. Right. Okay, and, and that is slightly more north. I, I would say uh, across the top of the Priscelli Hills is about five kilometres between Khan Maini and Khan uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, Kerig Markogion. Okay. So the, the, there are three on on the top there, and there's one further down towards mm -hmm. the uh, towards the north. It's, <clears throat> so the, the blue stones at Stonehenge. Yeah. Uh, so the sources of the blue stones at Stonehenge come from. Do we know which quarries they came from? Yes, like I said, the, the spotted dolerite um, comes mainly from Khan Godog. And the other main source that has been pinpointed by Rob Ixer particularly, who's been working with Mike Parker Pearson, mm -hmm. uh, was at the Kraigrossi Fellin site, um, mm -hmm. which is the one f further north, um, which will give you the rhyolite stones. Now, however, there are only three, I believe this is right, of the stones that remain, the blue stones that remain at Stonehenge, only three of the visible above the surface 23 are of rhyolite. Okay. Okay. So those two sites, those are the ones that were concentrated on by Mark Parker Pearson uh, uh, in, uh, in latterly in his investigations. And they're more on the north side of the ridge than uh, is... Uh, Khan mining, which is more, uh, which is more under investigation by mm. Tim Darville. So how can uh, how can it be said then, bearing in mind that there are uh, there are four stones remaining at Winemorn uh, yeah. in Priscelli, so the circle that is supposedly the source of the uh, of the blue stones at Stonehenge. Yes, there are four stones still standing at Winemorn. Yes. Um, how can we say what type of blue stone was in the rest of the circle and then taken to Stonehenge? Because that seems to me to be another um, something that the media just ran with when it's actually not clear cut at all, is it? Well, obviously, the, the missing stones uh, at Wymorn, you cannot uh, categorically say what kind of stone 
they were because there's no evidence. The stones mm. that are left, the four that are left, and the chip in stone hole number 91, don't ask me about how it got that nomenclature. Because uh, <laughs> they're not 91 stones. Are of, the, <laughs> are of the unspotted dolerite mm. sort. And that would have come from the Kerig Markogian um, quarry, which incidentally is nearest to, of the four quarries, is nearest to Wine Morn. So that kind of makes sense. Okay. But here's the thing. Did I mention this before? That uh, unspotted dolerite is underrepresent, underrepresented at Stonehenge. The vast mm. majority of blue stones at Stonehenge are of the spotted uh, variety. So we have so, a contradiction between what's at Winemore and what uh, and what actually uh, exists at uh, at Stonehenge. Kind of. It doesn't knock it out the ball, you know, out of the park uh, by any means, because we do have some unspotted dolerite at Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. so, but there were. It's estimated, I think, that, that there was a maximum of 30 stones at Wine Morn in that circle, which is yes. a very uneven circle, by, by the way. <laughs> some are more close together, some are more sort of uh, spread out. The one um, that is majorly talked about is, as I was saying, uh, Stone Hole 91, in which they found a chip that had come off the stone, presumably, as it was being lifted out. And that... The also the shape of the hole that stone came out of strongly matches uh, the sh um, the shape of stone the base of stone number sixty two uh, at Stonehenge. Right. Okay. okay so, so, so that's that's a good link. That's it's fair. That's that that's good. But it doesn't so, give you a whole circle being transported from one no. place to the other. Okay. So the the thinking was. That the the wine morn circle uh, was taken. That formed the original Aubrey hole circle. So, for those of you that don't know, the Aubrey holes at Stonehenge they were the first uh, that thought to have contained blue stones. It's that's not a certainty, but it's thought that they hold they held blue stones. Now, the thing is that there's fifty six Aubrey holes. Yeah. And there's only about 30 stones came from Wine Morn. So how, yeah. how is that rationalised in the theory that it was moved? Or is it not? Is it just a, a Well, you see, this is the thing. I don't think there is a theory that, that, that Wine Morn was moved wholesale. That's the impression left by this programme and by the press afterwards and, and before. Mm. Because that's a story. Yes. <laughs> it's a, that's a big story. And people mm. like big stories and, and strong narratives. And boy, oh boy, did the BBC programme have a strong narrative. Unfortunately, the pinpoints upon which the narrative hinged are actually pretty rubbish in comparison yes. to what was actually going on on the ground and the archaeological procedure that was went, that was gone through to establish the possibility that Winemore might have been a source for the stones. Mm. So, you know, at the end... Go on, carry on, uh, ask me another question then. I was going to say, well, <laughs> well, well, well uh, let's, let's look at the dating then because there's, yeah. some, uh, there's some major discrepancy in the dating, isn't there? I mean, in fact, some dating completely conflicts with the idea that they were taken to Stonehenge anyway. Yeah, one of the fulcrum points in the show was this idea that a burnt hazelnut, which can be dated, charcoal's good, you know, it's good stuff for dating, which was at the Craigrossi Fellin site, was dated to 3400 BC, 400 mm. years before the earliest that Stonehenge went up. Therefore, there was a gap of 400 years which had to be filled. If there was quarrying going on at Craigrossi Fellin, then the stones from there had to be some somewhere in the interim. And that was the whole premise about looking for somewhere roundabout where it could they could have been. However, the problem with Craig Rossifelin is the source for this, is that the Craig Rossifelin, I, I'll keep repeating this, mm. was a source of rhyolite, not spotted dolerite. Yes. Okay. And furthermore, a reminder... Wine Morn is made of unspotted dolerite, not spotted dolerite, and not rhyolite. <laughs> yes. 
So basically, one morning so, Stonehenge aren't matching at all. So the through line saying. from from the hazelnut at Craig Rossi Fallen to Stonehenge just not just falls apart. Moreover, the 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 site from which the majority of stones at stone at blue stones at Stonehenge came from, i.e., Khan Khan Dog, a source of spotted dolerite, has a date range from 3,400 right up to 3,000 for quarrying activity going on there. And in another source, in one of Mike Parker Pearson's own uh, online uh, lectures, he categorically states, we've got a range of dates here that go from there, from there, right up to the point where uh, Stonehenge is being built. So there isn't a, necess a necessity for there to be stones lying no. around in formations on the Preseli Hills for all of that time period before they were taken to Stonehenge. Not mm. for a moment saying that isn't true, mm. but they weren't all in <laughs> Wine Morn, the yes. stone circle of Wine Morn. Yes, I think one of the one of the difficulties about uh, wine mourners uh, as an overall source, anyway, is the fact that that well, the, that the maths just doesn't work. Does it? The, the numbers don't tally, um, and uh, I, should we even talk about blue Stonehenge? Well, if you're going to play the maths game, it's a it's a fun one um, because nobody knows you know the order in which things happen there. You could uh, you could. Uh, <clears throat> at any one time, the maximum number of blue stones that you can have at Stonehenge, according to the holes and everything, is 80. Yes. There are 56 Aubrey holes, and it's estimated that there are 24 holes in blue Stonehenge. Add those together, what number do you get? Yes, mm. yes. So yeah. so the Aubrey it, holes and blue Stonehenge do equal the Q&R holes. Uh, added together, yes. Yes. Yes, they do. So that that is a tan tantalising uh, number. But there are mm. all sorts of uh, um, other theories about how things have been rearranged over time. Because you've got to remind, be reminded that the arrangement that the bluestones are in now, i.e. There's, there's a circle and an inner horseshoe of its own of, of bluestones, that's the third iteration of the arrangement of Blue stones at Stonehenge. Whether yes. you include, uh, um, we should call it the West Amesbury Henge, correct? We we should call it the West Amesbury Henge. Yes, yeah, the, the Blue Stone um, Henge. <clears throat> yes, it's whether you include that, that or not. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Um, I mean, as you say, the uh, the blue stones were rearranged uh, <laughs> on more than one occasion at Stonehenge. Um, I, so, I mean, what you know? What's your takeaway from this, really? My takeaway is that uh, we're on to something, but it's hugely complex. We don't mm. know enough to be able to really describe uh, everything perfectly. Yes, bluestone did come from Stonehenge, and yes, more more than likely, I'm perfectly happy to say that some stones from Wymore did, uh, you know, did sit there in that enormous circle. It has to be said. Yes. 110 metres across, which uh, qualifies mm -hmm. it as the third largest in Britain or England. Anyway, it's... Uh, It'll be Britain know, it's because only... Brodga Bro uh, yeah. would overtake Brodga, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, so I'm perfectly happy to accept that stones at Blue Stones were in the landscape, had already been quarried and spent some time in the landscape in a monument or other before being taken there, but mm. we haven't necessarily found those monuments or where they were mm. <laughs> where they were before they were, were taken. And I do believe in combination with that, st some stones from uh, Khan Goidog were taken directly from the quarrying there, directly to Stonehenge. So it's, I would say it's a mixture of stuff. Yeah. So there's some truth in, in the wine morn thing, but that it was... Transported wholesale is uh, yes. not supportable. I think uh, personally, I, I think it's f f it's far more evocative, really, that to imagine that that maybe communities from uh, from various places in what is now Wales, um, you know, that, that they they'd all built circles out of bluestones, 
and that different communities took um, pieces of their uh, of their circles to Wiltshire, and that the the blue stones that ended up being the circle at Stonehenge were actually part of a much greater coming together of communities. Yeah, 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 um, uh, and and you know, I mean, I, I'm. Uh, the musings that uh, Mike Barker Pearson has had on this subject, I'm perfectly willing to go along with, you know, from the uh, community point of view, the sociological point of view and the tribal point of view of moving to, to Wiltshire and there being some kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of moderation that occurs on the Wiltshire Plains between people from one side of the... Uh, uh, of uh, then... England uh, uh, and another, because the other bit of the equation you must remember is that the bones that were analysed from Al Albury Hole Seven, and that had the strontian analysis done on them, made it quite clear that a very large proportion uh, of the people that were at Stonehenge round about the time it was being used as a cemetery had their origins in Wales. Hmm. Not only that, there were animal remains that also have had the strontium analysis done from whales. Yeah. And also, just another little bit of spice on this. Mike Parker Pearson <laughs> spent eight years digging around, uh, you know, on, on the on the Priscellis there. And um, there's a huge gap. Is it, I, you know, I said, you know, 3,400 to 3,000 BC. Hmm. Then... Activity stops. Mm -hmm. There is there is no dating from any site around there for a thousand years. It's 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 like That's they deserted the place. It? Yeah, yeah. Am amazing. You know, and they do have you know reasonable dates from one more about you know when it was the stones might have been taken uh, uh, out there. You know that those dates kind of uh, add up. No quarrel there at all. A uh, thousand years. Yeah. It, it, well, it's it's something to play with, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. I think it, it all illustrates the point that uh, that it, you know every little detail you look at suddenly it's like a firework. It suddenly explodes into another thousand little details that you need to look at. Hmm. Uh, and um, I, I'm amazed that I've you know kind of retained so much actually because i haven't been embedded in this stuff stonehenge we've kind of skirted around a lot as prehistory guys you know because there is so much more out there uh, because there is so much more out there uh, and yet once you start to look at stonehenge then wow wow mm. but don't take the stuff you see in the media this is not the first nor the last time that we're going to you know pop up mm. probably and comment on what's being said in, about stonehenge in the media no indeed i mean sometimes it is just outright misleading and uh, and some of this stuff is you know the, the biggest problem is that if you if you take something that is wrong uh, or you take something that maybe it might be right, but people stop then exploring. They just accepted that as a given when, when in actual fact, the, the reality might be far more exciting and being completely overlooked. So, yes, it is very mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Hey so, yeah, well, I'm, I'm surprised, actually. I think we probably feel we've got a more sort of cohesive view of, of the stuff at Stonehenge than I've thought uh, we mm. did for some people i'm sure that will have clarified some things for some people i'm sure you'll come away from this conversation <laughs> so, more confused than you about? already yeah. are and for that we can mm. well i don't know if we can apologize <laughs> really that's just the way uh, way it is mm. um but we shall be watching this space and we're very very grateful actually that we've gone through this exercise of really taking a look at uh, the yes. detail of, uh, of, of uh, all this concern over the blue stones. Yes. yes, yes, it is. It's profoundly fascinating stuff, and and there is still <laughs> much clarity to be dragged out of it. Mm -hmm. That goes uh, goes. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that's enough of that. I think for the time being. I think being. so. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Watch your space. Should we should we dive forwards? Should we do something else now? I think so. What do you think that something else might be? I, I think I think we should I, th I think we should um, 
I think we should nominate somebody. Okay, let's do that. Oh my goodness, we've made it. We've made it to that time <laughs> when it is time for what is it time for? It's Rupert? time for. It's time for Stonehead of the Stone, Month. Stonehead of the Month. Stonehead of the Month. Stonehead of the Month. Just a head of the month, <laughs> just like what I said. I know I'm a kid at heart, but that never gets tired for me. We are um, the children. <laughs> Forgive us. Who is it this month, Michael? It is Stonehead of the Month. This month is Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark. Hey. And the reason <laughs> we are cheering uh, Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark the same reason, you know, we, we cheer all our Stoneheads. It's uh, services rendered mm. uh, <laughs> in the uh, service of um, megalithic stuff and prehistoric stuff above and beyond the call of duty. And I really think this uh, qualifies uh, very, very nicely indeed because um, do you know where to go if you wanted to explore <laughs> tombs on Orkney in 3D without actually going to Orkney? No, I guess not. Nor examine uh, Neolithic carved stone balls uh, without visiting a museum and breaking the glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> no, well, no, you can find Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark's uh, page on Sketchfab and do just that. Uh, you can explore uh, the Orkney tombs and earth houses. Uh, you can explore the Ring of Brogge. You can, can explore uh, the stones of Stennis. Uh, all from the comfort of your own uh, screen. Now, we're going to do something a, a bit more fulsome about uh, this and maybe even in, invite um, Dr Anderson Weimark onto a show. But yeah. this sewn head of a month is just by way of alerting you to the fact, if you didn't already know, that uh, these things are available. I'll put a, a link in the description below for... Um, for uh, to go to uh, Dr. Anderson Weimark's uh, Sketch Fab page where you can examine these things. I don't know, some of them may even be in, you, you know, if you've got a headset, I think some of these you can actually walk around in with your VR oh, headset. Wow, well, can you? I didn't know that. I, that would be I, amazing. I, I think you can. I think that's one of the purposes. Sketchfab, if you didn't know, is a repository for anybody that, uh, you know, creates uh, stuff in, in 3D, whether it's sci-fi, you know, whether it's real stuff, stuff that's been captured through photogrammetry or whether it's been created in a 3D modelling sculpture. It's for artists and photographers who work in, in 3D. And, you know, besides all, I mean, yeah, if you do that, um, it, it's uh, it's a fantastic mm. resource and a, and a fun resource, and there's masses of people uh, contributing to it. But Interesting. Um, Dr. Interesting. Hugo Anderson Weimark's contribution is is um, there is a chunk of his stuff on some of the uh, museum websites as well, uh, mm -hmm. National Museum Scotland and places they've particularly the um, the scans of the uh, carved stone balls that you can uh, you can turn them around and analyse them in minute detail. Oh, it's just Brilliant work. Brilliant. Wonderful stuff. And that is why um, we award uh, Stonehead of the Month to Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I think it's time now um, to uh, the final sprint to the end of the show. <laughs> And I'll leave that to you, Mr. Soskin, with your bit of whimsy. Whimsy. We've got a lovely bit of whimsy. This one, Well, it made me laugh anyway. If it doesn't make you laugh, <laughs> I can only apologise. <laughs> now, it's, see, we talk about the Scythians from time to time, don't we? All the Scythians. All the Scythians. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't mind. <laughs> you say Take potato, I say <laughs> potato. <laughs> uh, <laughs> indeed, well... Uh, Herodotus, the Greek historian, wrote that the Scythians used a plant to produce smoke that no Grecian vapour bath can surpass. <laughs> he said that, transported by the vapour, they shout aloud. Mm. 
That's what Herodotus wrote. Well, okay. Now, the, so this discovery, this little whimsy discovery here, it goes back to 2013 when archaeologists were called to excavate a burial mound that was in the way of some developments for new pylons. Uh, and this is uh, over in uh, uh, in <laughs> in Russia. And uh, truth be told, they didn't expect to find very much because the site had clearly been robbed out more than once over the last few thousand years. But they found that one chamber had been completely missed over all this time and it was still fully intact. Hey. So... They excavated all manner of gold artefacts, and some of them are absolutely breathtaking, uh, including cups and bracelets and rings and a bunch of drug paraphernalia. Uh, we call it drugs. They probably called it... A way of life. Perfume, eh? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but but the, the reason I put this in whimsy is just how hardcore were these people? Right. Uh, they found the proof of Herodotus's claims... Uh, about their uh, intoxicating vapours, uh, that uh, analysis of uh, some of the vessels showed that they smoked opium whilst simultaneously burning cannabis as incense. <laughs> I don't care what you say, those guys must have been off their faces. <laughs> I'm not surprised they were shouting aloud. No. <laughs> I wonder where Herodotus got that from. Yeah, yeah. yeah it Makes you wonder about thing. Grecian vapour baths as well. <laughs> it does. I've got to say, before I read this uh, quote from Herodotus, I didn't know he talked about Grecian vapour baths. I'd never heard of a Grecian vapour bath. So, uh, yeah. I go. wonder what those vapours were, because, you know, yeah. without him refer sort of comparing it to uh, uh, some uh, druggists from up, up north... Yeah. Um, you begin to think, oh, well, maybe that vapour wasn't just the gentle, you know, warming steam from... <laughs> yeah, well, there's, uh, there's a the few bars. instances, uh, there are a few instances, aren't there? We found that shrine in Israel, the Bronze Age shrine in Israel, that where they had uh, mixed cannabis with dung. Uh, yes, had burnt on an altar, which uh, and the use the reason for mixing it with dung is that it lowers the burning temperature, so you get much more smoke with it. Uh, <laughs> See, here's the thing, though, Rupert. I mean, I've led far too sheltered a life, really, to be uh, <laughs> commenting either way on the habits of uh, of, of people uh, using mind altering substances. Uh, at I plead all. the fifth. I, I, you plead the fifth. <laughs> You don't want me to ask you any questions <laughs> right now that might illuminate uh, well, you know, the I, kind I of had, things. I had a moderately misspent period of my youth. Um, okay. Well, by degrees, I, we I find didn't out. mix anything with dung. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, but it's um, well. The trouble is, nobody's doing the experimental archaeology on this. Are they? <laughs> Do you know what they probably are? They're just not writing about it. <laughs> that is fair comment. <laughs> Do you think, on that note, I do. <laughs> We should say uh, bye bye to our uh, dear listeners. Thank um, you for listening, everybody. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's been real. <laughs> <laughs> it has, it has, yes. Uh, and, um, uh, no, we're, or, yeah. as always, full of gratitude for your mm. uh, good ears and uh, your indeed, good feedback yes. And, and your... uh, don't don't forget to uh, have a look at our Patreon page as well and see if you want to if... come and join the crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're not already one of, of, of them, mm. obviously. And if you are, thank you. Indeed. Yet again, for your support. Anyway, that's enough whiffling on. <laughs> Let us sail gently off in, uh, into the sunset and uh, say <laughs> bye-bye for the last time. <laughs> Take care, folks. We'll see you Bye. next time. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.